As an aspiring first-generation doctor in my family, I didn't really know how to approach studying for the NMAT. And like what most people do, I searched on the internet and I asked my upperclassmen on how to do so. And back when I was in college, there weren't many resources that were useful for studying for the NMAT by yourself. So following my upperclassmen's advice, I just attended the review center. But after going through the process, I realized that one could easily self-review for the NMAT and still achieve a high score. And in this video, I'll teach you how you can do that. Hey guys, my name is Luis and I'm a student from the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. Now, I recognize that not a lot of people can spare the time nor the money to attend the review center to review for the NMAT. So I took the time to research all the best tips and advice to combine it with my own tips and advice on how to best prepare for the NMAT and put it all into one video. I'll be going over three main topics in this video. Firstly, the general plan on how to review for the NMAT in one month. Two, some specific tips to how to prepare for each subtest in the NMAT. And three, some last minute advice on what you can do the day before your NMAT. When preparing for any major exam, it's always important to know where you're starting from and to know where your weaknesses are. And this is the point of taking a mock exam. Since you're only limited to studying for a month, it's important to know which areas you're weakest at so that you can maximize the time you have. The best pretest you can take is the mock exam that CEM gives you after you register for your NMAT exam date, since most of the topics covered in that mock exam will also be covered in the actual NMAT. So best to take note of those as you go through. Once you get your mock exam score back, take note of the subject you scored lowest in and the subject you scored highest in, and that will determine the order in which you review the subjects. And regardless of your score in each subtest, your focus is to at least maintain or improve your performance in each subtest because even though you scored high on the mock exam, doesn't mean you'll perform the same way on the actual exam. This is because in exam preparations, you want to leave as little to chance as possible, and the only way to do this is to prepare as best as you can. In this study plan, you'll be studying 8 hours a day, which will be the divided into two four-hour blocks, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. This will be done five days a week, which will leave you two days to take a rest or to do other activities. Obviously, this is just a guide, so you can adjust this timetable to fit your schedule. So if you feel that eight hours is too much time to study per day, you can reduce that to a lesser amount so long as you feel that you're still covering the material you need to cover. So as an example for the application of this study plan, you can use mornings from 8 to 12 for your morning session and 1 to 5 p.m. as your afternoon session which will give you a one hour break to eat lunch. But if you're not much of a morning person or you don't have the time in the morning to study, you can easily shift this to start in the afternoon where you can start at 1 p.m. and study till 5, take a one hour break from 5 to 6 to eat dinner, and start your second four hour block from 6 to 10. During study days, I recommend you allocate one study block to the mental ability subtest of the EDMAT and the second study block to your academic proficiency subtest. The reason for this is that it applies to a learning concept called interleaving. And what interleaving is, is a technique found by psychologists to help improve one's learning. So whether you're learning math or learning a new sport, interleaving's been found to improve the rate at which you improve or the rate at which you acquire a new skill. So for example, you can spend your first study block learning perceptual acuity, and for your second study block, you can study biology. What this does is that just as your brain is getting used to studying perceptual acuity, you challenge it by switching immediately to studying another subject, therefore strengthening the bonds of the learning process. And as a bonus tip, if you find that you can't study for 4 hours straight, you can apply the Pomodoro method. And what this is, is that you take short breaks in between long sessions of uninterrupted work. Usually, the Pomodoro method is 25 minutes of work followed by 5 minutes of rest. But for exams such as this, I find that 50 minutes of work and 10 minutes of rest is a much more optimal interval. And in addition to this, you can mix up your Pomodoro sessions by reviewing the material during one session and then doing practice questions the next session. That way, you don't get bored during the 4-hour block. As I mentioned earlier, the NMAT is divided into two main parts, the mental ability subtest and the academic proficiency subtest. The mental ability subtest include verbal, quantitative reasoning, inductive reasoning, perceptual acuity, while the academic proficiency subtests include biology, chemistry, physics, and the social sciences. Now for the verbal subtest, this subtest basically tests your reading comprehension as well as your vocabulary. So if you're a type of person who reads a lot, this test should be quite easy for you. But one trick I find very useful for the comprehension portion of this subtest is starting first from the question. So if you already know what to look for, it'll be much quicker for you to go through the passage. In addition, it also helps to know how to skim the text so that you're not wasting so much time reading the entire body over and over again. And this is something that you develop by trying to force yourself to read just a bit faster than you would normally do, but still be able to comprehend what the text is actually saying. And this is something that's easier said than done, but it's a skill you develop over time by just practicing over and over again. Another common question in this type of subtest 
in our word analogies. And you have to fill in what word properly matches that word based on the pattern of the first two words given. So the best way to prepare for these types of questions is to familiarize yourself with the types of analogies that they can give you so that you can easily recognize them during the exam and have a good idea on what word appropriately fills in the blank for the question. I'll link an article down below along with all the other sources I recommend for helping you prepare for the EDMAT, so make sure to check those out after watching this video. Now the questions in the inductive reasoning subtest are something you'd be familiar with if you've taken several IQ tests, as the point of the subtest is to simply test your ability to recognize patterns. And given that, this is the type of exam that's best prepared for by doing practice tests over and over again. One technique that I like to apply for this subtest, especially for ones that involve shapes, is to develop a theory based on one aspect of the repeating pattern and see if it holds out for the entire sequence. And once I find that pattern, that's the time I choose the choice that best follows that theory. And if you can't find, you restart the process all over again. So as you can see in this example, you can see that they're adding one line in for every new panel in the examples. So from here, I go over to the choices and check which of the following choices follows that pattern. And from here, you can see that the correct answer is C. Another technique that I like to use is to write down the alphabet and the corresponding letters based on its position, so A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, etc. Because I find it's very helpful for figuring out the patterns that involve letters. Now the quantitative reasoning subtest in the NMAT is nothing too special as it just basically tests your basic math skills. So multiplication, division, subtraction, addition, problem solving, and data interpretation. So a major hurdle that most people will encounter here is if they're a slow test taker or they tend to get nervous when encountering math problems. So the best way to overcome this is to just to take as many practice tests as possible if you find that you're very slow in doing math problems. And I recommend that you time yourself doing each of these math problems so you can actually track how long it takes you to answer each subtest. And you can track whether or not you're increasing your answering speed over time. Now the perceptual acuity subtest is something I find is probably more talent-based than actually skill-based because of the nature of the figures given to you it's really hard to actually practice for this subtest. But that doesn't mean you can't actually improve in this area. I remember during my MAT preparation, this is an area I struggled in a lot. And it was actually my lowest score in my diagnostic exam and on the actual NMAT. But it was still worth preparing for this subtest because the improvement between my diagnostic exam and the actual NMAT was so big that it made a huge difference in my percentile rank overall. Now often the task in these perceptual acuity questions is to find a specific shape given to you among the choices given. And often, there's a lot of noise that they put additional shapes that will distract you from that. So one technique is to just really focus in on the shape and try to find that general shape amongst the choices while eliminating the choices that don't obviously have that specific shape. So from there, if you can narrow down four to five choices down to just two or three, then that will give you a good chance of actually finding the correct answer and that's better than just randomly guessing out of the initial choices given to you. Now for the mirror image questions, the trick here is to divide the original image into a 3x3 three three grid. And remember that these mirror images are divided along a horizontal plane. And what's on the left will now be on the right, and what's on the right will now be on the left in the mirrored image. And from there, you can determine on the, among the choices which best fits what the ideal mirrored image should be, and you can eliminate choices based on that. I'm not sure though how this will apply for the online setting in the NMAT, but when the NMAT was still in the written format, it'd be very easy to compare the choices across the sheet of paper. But even if the choices are presented in a different orientation in the online exam, the principles can still be applied. For questions that involve finding the matching sentence amongst the choices, the trick here is to compare the choices against one another. And by comparing two choices, see what makes them differ, and based on that trait, see which one is the correct one relative to the one given. And from there, you can eliminate the one that doesn't match. And you repeat that over several steps until you're just left with the correct answer. Now moving on to the academic proficiency subtest. So if you took a major in college that involved any of these subjects such as chemistry, biology, physics, or the social sciences, you probably want to save that subtest for last since you'll find reviewing for that subtest relatively easy compared to all the other subtests. So for the social sciences subtest in the NMAT, it basically covers three major social sciences, sociology, psychology, and anthropology. Among these three subjects, I would prioritize studying psychology and sociology since a lot of the concepts in these two fields overlap. When you're reading for this subject, don't focus on just memorizing the facts, but try to understand how to apply it since most of the hard questions that will come up will involve application of the concepts you learn for this subtest. As an example, I remember there was this one scenario that involved a moral dilemma where a man had to steal medicine to save his ill wife. 
and then it does an application of the Kohlberg's moral theory of development. And then based on the scenario, I had to determine which stage of the moral theory development was the man in. So that's the type of question that you should expect in the exam and will be the ones that you probably find very hard come exam day. When studying for biology, like the social sciences, you don't need to focus on the very nitty gritty facts too so much. Rather, focus on the basic concepts within each area of study. What I've seen online is that they generally recommend that you study the areas related to human physiology. And that makes sense given that you're entering a, the medical field and what you'll be studying are humans. So probably the areas of biology most related to the human body will be the ones that are most high yield for the exam. Now, when reviewing for the chemistry portion of the EDMAT, my general recommendation is that you focus on all the concepts that are math heavy. So anything within general chemistry that has a formula, that's probably important to know. So I recommend that you take the time to write down a lot of these formulas on the flashcard so you can easily access them when you're reviewing. And also try to focus on learning how to apply them. Because basically, majority of the questions for the chemistry portion in the EDMAT will just be them giving you all the information. And you, all you need to do is just recognize which formula you need to use and just plug in the information and then just find the correct answer. Physics is very similar in that it's also very math heavy. And the nice thing about physics and chemistry is that a lot of their concepts overlap, such as thermodynamics and the gas laws. So other than those, important things to know are your mechanics, so the basic Newtonian physics, so like displacement, speed, velocity, and all that. That's stuff important to know. So also take the time to write down the important formulas that you need to know for the exam. And on top of that, you also need to know some basics of circuitry. So calculating the voltage based on the circuit given is, also, is, is a very high yield topic to know. So also taking practice tests to learn how to answer those types of questions is also very useful. So now on day 30 or roughly 4 weeks after you started first reviewing for the NMAT, you now then want to take a post test. So, so this can take the form of any test that you can find whether it's from a review book or you can just take another CEM test that you found online. The important thing is that you gauge where you are now compared to where you started at. So you have a rough idea of what score to expect when you do take the NMAT in a couple of days. And then from there, you get to see which areas you're still weak at. And that'll give you some idea of what you can cram on with your last remaining day of review before your rest day, before the actual exam. And the reason I'm saying this is that before your actual exam, you don't want to be studying at all because that'll just stress you out. And at that point, you've already reviewed the best you can. So my general recommendation for what to do the day before your exam is just to sit back, relax, and just let your mind ease. So whatever you find relaxing, whether it's like hanging out with your family, reading a book, or just playing video games, do whatever you can to let your mind ease so that you're not so stressed out and you're getting rid of those anxiety jitters on the days leading up to the exam. So to recap, I went over my general study plan on how to study for the NMAT in one month and as well as my tips for each of the subtests in the NMAT. If you want more tips on how you can prepare for the NMAT, you can check out this video here on the online NMAT and this video here on the different test-taking strategies I used when I took the NMAT. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.